All right, guys, what's up? Nick Howell here, data center dude, hanging out with the newest CTO at VMware, Amanda Blevins. Amanda, how you doing? Fantastic. I don't know what day it is, but I'm doing quite well. <laughs> well, it is, it's day three, it's Wednesday, so that means we have the party tonight, the concert. Are we doing a concert? Yeah, it's like a concert, like some local bands, some fun activities. It's like nice. a whole thing. Nice. Yeah. I'm curious, I think that one of the reasons I wanted to sit down and talk with you is... Um, you have I've I've watched you rise over the last couple of years, and it's it was awesome to see you become a VP, and then this year it was announced you were going to be the first or America's CTO. Yeah. Tell me about that journey. Like, how do how, what do we need to know about Amanda Blevins? Like, what's <laughs> how did you get to where you are? Did you even see this coming? Is it something you aspired to? Yeah, I definitely aspired to it. Yeah. Um, so it was a ton of hard work and certain expletives in that sense. Right. There. Um, but no, I mean. There's a saying, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get kind yeah. of thing. So people might say, oh, it's lucky at all these opportunities. But there are opportunities I created from all this hard work. And internally and maybe externally, I'm kind of known to uh, speak my opinion quite often. Same here. Sometimes ruffles some feathers. And <laughs> then, uh, but also, you know, you get a little tension from that. As long as it's backed up with, you know, good data and, yeah. and you know, the ability to help shape whatever should be in its place. So. Yeah. That's like the overall thing, but yeah, a ton of hard work. <laughs> it's been noted before that my passion is a double-edged sword. <laughs> yeah, no, I can hear that. I hear that. It's, uh, it's known to frustrate people sometimes, yeah. but... Yeah. No, I've, I've, so I've been a part of the V community since, I think, 2008. Okay. Very early adopter as a customer and ended up joining NetApp in, in 2011. Nice. So that's been a fun ride, and, um, and I was one of the TMEs for VMware Solutions at NetApp cool. 10 years ago. So just, I mean... Where has your journey taken you over the last ten years? How did you how did you get into VMware originally? Well, it's a that's a good story. So I was again that PETA customer, and um, it was right when vSphere four was coming out. Yep. And I worked for this company called IHS, and I was their architect for all things compute, storage, whatever. And I used you know ESX for a couple of years before that since two dot something. And so everything was standardized on three, or, or not even, there wasn't even a standard. So I was in charge of like setting the standard, creating all the architectural documentation, et cetera. And then there was this use case where the sales folks want to be able to demo stuff to customers. And I'm like, oh, well, let me use these virtual desktops and back end it with Lab Manager, because, you know, VMware like five products in and Lab Manager. Right. One. And so I'm building out the solution. In the meantime, I'm beta testing vSphere 4. And so I'm all sorts of PETA everywhere I go, right? Like, hey, VMware, this stuff doesn't work. You know, vSphere 4 doesn't work. HP, my C7000 Blade chassis doesn't work. Cisco, what is this 1000V thing? It doesn't work. Right. Where is some documentation? Can anyone <laughs> help me? I have all the vendors on the phone. And so one night, my, like, you know, early evening, my SC from VMware calls me up, and he's like, hey, I'm taking another position inside VMware. Do you want my job? And I was like, uh, yes. So he's like, well, there's a couple other people in the running. Um, and clearly I knew the tech, right? Because, yeah. well, you know, I've been using it for a while and there wasn't a lot. And um, it was just a matter of meeting with his boss and my future boss. We had a lunch and my SE Gavin, he provided like a presentation he uses with customers. So really, um, Jeff Margulies was the, the hiring manager. He just wanted to make sure that I was coherent and able to form sentences and interact with people and things like that. That lunch went well, and then two weeks later, I was had my offer to work for VMware. So you started as a, as an SE. Started as an SE in the that, company. That's ground up almost. I mean, that's that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, how did you go from the sales organization getting into more technical and product type stuff? Yeah. So as an SE. Um, you know, clearly the job is to, you're assigned a certain set of customers and you're partnered with the rep. And I was a core SE, a generalist, and I've always been a generalist, so it's good. But you're partnered with the rep and then you have a quota and, you know, you need to make your quota. Sure. But in addition to that at VMware, even now today, as long as you're doing your job and you're getting it done, especially if you're getting it done well, whatever else you want to do in your free time at work, like, you can do. You can dive into new projects, you can work with VUs, et cetera. So I was able to have a lot of opportunity inside VMware especially when I joined what we call the CTO Ambassador Program. We right. still have that today. So it, it gives the opportunity for SCs, PSO, TAM, support, all the folks that are individual contributors that are you know, customer-facing 
to um, be extensions of the office of the CTO. So then I had more opportunities to work with product teams and be used and improve product and roadmap. And as we acquired companies and new solutions, and I, you know, even though there weren't specialists for those things, I'm like, oh, I want to learn that. I want to learn that. And so I was making a name for myself and moved up through the ranks from senior systems engineer to staff and then became a principal. And so through that and the CTO ambassador program, I was exposed to a lot of executives. And um, then it was like January and I remember I was snowboarding up in the mountains and I received this email that I got reorged without anyone telling me. Like, that oh, no. call me up. Like, no one let me know. <laughs> it was just like an email. Hey, now you're solution architect. I was like, I don't think I want to be a solution architect. Yeah. And the leader of that team, I was like, um, you know, what's the charter? What are we doing? And I don't want to do that. And he's like, I don't care. You're not special. And I'm like, okay, well, um, now I'm going to look for another job. And I looked outside of VMware. I looked inside of VMware. And the program manager for the CTO ambassadors was having a conversation with the executive sponsor of the program, our CTO, Ray O'Farrell, at the time. And I don't know what, I mean, she knew the situation, but I don't know how it came up in their meeting, their conversation. But supposedly, it was like, you know, Ray said something like, oh, Amanda can help with that. And she's kind of like, well, um. And so she said, like, hey, Amanda's looking around. And Ray's like, oh, well, I got a job for her. There you go. So I talked to Ray O'Farrell and got an offer to come to the office of the CTO to really bridge that gap between field and R&D. Yeah. I, I think that what VMware has done with the office of the CTO should be a blueprint, yeah. um, especially over the last decade with the way things have evolved. Um, you guys have had your own turmoils through the acquisitions and the releases and all of that stuff. Yeah. But I mean, that's the one thing that's always stood steady for me from you know outside looking in is yeah. the office of the CTO, your community programs, the ambassador program you mentioned, all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and the ability to, like you said, bridge R&D and, and field and product and all of that bring have bi-directional feedback in communication channels yeah. is, is really big and something yeah. we try to emulate as well at NetApp. So yeah. I, I, I definitely look to that as a role model for yeah. some of the stuff that we do. It's a lot of fun and you know, because we do sit outside of the different product we use. So yeah. Our stuff is innovation, you know, ESG, environmental social governance. You know, totally. we, we do a blockchain that is a product. For the most part, the team on on research and innovation, we just do you know, one to three year roadmap product type stuff, or we do five to 10 year research stuff. Or, so it's a lot of fun. Nice, nice. So what do you, it's 2022. Yeah. You're the America CTO at VMware now. What's your, what do you got in mind for the next few years? Like what's on top of your mind? Actually, hold that thought. I have okay. one more question I just remembered. Okay. Of all of the things that you worked on coming up, do you have a favorite of all of the products that you were, do you have a little pet product that, that you hold dear, near and dear? So um, maybe a year or two in, and I was just fresh off of being a customer, right? Yeah. And so at least in that last role of IHS, I wasn't on call. But it was very fresh of being on call and being up late at night and trying to figure out issues and all this stuff. And we just bought, uh, acquired a company, and we had this product called Capacity IQ. Yeah, I and remember I was that. it's like, oh, I love Cap IQ, right? And I'm like, it's showing everyone, oh, look at this new thing, Cap IQ. You know, you can make planning. You can show people how they're wasting your resources. And then right after that, we acquired Integrium, which is yep. what became V-Realize Operations. There you eventually. go. And so VR Ops was like, this is magic. I wish I had this when I was a sysadmin. So like, I didn't have to spend 26 hours on a call when something was down <laughs> right. and find the root cause analysis. Like, it just pointed me to it. So I would say, and then those combined, right? When it became VR Ops at Integrin and, and Cap IQ products. So I would say that's kind of like, was my favorite. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of people that hold a lot of affection to, uh, to be the whole V-Realize suite, yeah. right? Yeah. And VROPS is definitely a big part of that. Yeah. All right, so back to what I was asking before. What's next? Like, you guys made some pretty big announcements. Um, I will say selfishly that I'm excited to see VMware get back to what brought it to the dance in the first place. A lot of focus on vSphere, a lot of focus yeah. on centralizing and consolidating functionality into the central user plane of yeah. vCenter, right? Yeah. Bringing the Tanzu stuff and container and Kubernetes more into that central thing. Right. I mean, I, I'm a user of ESX before it was a virtual center, <laughs> so I, I'm that old. Yeah, before it even existed. Right. It only came out with VI3. I actually know that it stands for Elastic Sky. <laughs> you know, I, I'm that, I've been around that long. 
So I, I, I look at that and I rem- I could never use VMware or ESX without vCenter ever again. So yeah. the more that more functionality and features that can be packed into the management of a workload, the, regardless of whether it's a uh, an encapsulation of compute and resources or whether it's a node in a Kubernetes cluster or whatever it is, right. having that universal control plane of sorts yeah. is, is going to be massive in the future. And that's, I heard a lot of that echoing out of the general session yesterday from, from you and Kit. Yeah. Um, Ragu's focus on the developer experience, yeah. folks shifting focus from infrastructure to getting it all out of the way and just so you could build cool stuff. Right, right. From your perspective and whatever you can safely share with the public, yeah. like yeah. What, uh, what's the next few years look like? What's, what's the top of mind for you in the office of the CTO right now? Yeah, well, you know, we call this event the center of the multi-cloud universe. We talk about cross-cloud services, which is our brand yeah. for multi-cloud services. For the last, I don't know, 10 months or so, Kit and I spent a lot of time co-authoring a paper on multi-cloud services as a taxonomy for the industry, not like favorable to VMware, not favorable to a hyperscaler, not favorable to something, but defining multi-cloud services and you know their characteristics and the layers of them. And you know now we've brought in our branding and our solutions to align to those where we have solutions. We don't have solutions in all the layers or for everything. And that's why we have a great ecosystem and partners out there to accomplish multi-cloud. And I was just speaking with an analyst this morning, um, you know, talking more in depth about our strategy. And, and I was sharing with her how I think last year folks decided, hey, we've been doing this cloud stuff and maybe we didn't achieve what we wanted to out of our projects. So we didn't yeah. meet our KPIs or we didn't get that, you know, TCO we were looking for or this is harder than we thought or something like that. And now... You know, people are kind of taking a breath, resetting, and trying to be more intentional about how they go forward. Yeah. And so I think if folks you know, decide, hey, it makes more sense to use native public cloud services here, great, do that, right? But make sure it makes business sense, technical sense, et cetera, and then use multi-cloud services where it makes more sense too. So I've been focusing a lot on that, and that's where a lot of my conversations are because people are kind of like, you know, phase two of their cloud projects where they're resetting and say, okay, that worked, that did it, how do we do it better this yeah. time? So there's that aspect. And then personally, um, I love manufacturing. I just kind of geek out about it. Okay. I work for the first place I used uh, uh, ESX was at a manufacturing company where I was a server at storage admin. So I own the whole stack. So I'm like, I'm just going to do this. Right. right? Uh, and then save the company a bunch of money. So I was allowed to, but um I got to really learn what it meant to do manufacturing at plants and that process control network stuff. And, and you know, they didn't want IT out there messing with their plants right. and breaking things. So I had to really work on those relationships, but I learned a lot. And um, now I'm working on this project for edge and manufacturing called open process automation. Okay. It's a standard that's being created in the industry to get rid of the monolithic old school DCS systems with the IO cards and the CPU and memory in them. Does that and fall under open telemetry? Um, or is that I, something different? No, that's something different. Okay. So this is a forum under the Open Group, Open Process Automation Forum. They've been in place about three to four years, okay. and they're creating these standards for open process automation to move away from these monolithic systems. And so it's a project that I'm working on with other companies, like Yokogawa is the OTSI um, Operational Technology System Integrator. You know, Dell is a part of it. Intel is a part of it. Schneider Electric is the company that has the software that does the process controls, and we're doing this all for ExxonMobil. And ExxonMobil is like the first company that's really going to implement in production, um, but there's, I, I think, 100 plus companies a part of the forum. And so VMware is also part of the forum, helping set standards. And I just did a, a breakout on it um, with Dave Hedge, an architect from Exxon, a fellow there. And he and we must have had, I don't know, 20 people asking questions during the breakout wow. afterwards from these different oil and gas, energy, other manufacturing companies like, how do I do this? You know, how do I bring more of these cloud-like or virtualization and advanced virtualization capabilities to my plant floor so I don't have to rely on this 30-year-old technology? You know, yeah. So I can get new, fresh, young people in that are interested in, in my company. Like, we're, we're making these control applications container-based. They were modernizing them as we go. Like, wow. you know, I see your face. Like, really, are we doing that, you know? Wow. So we're really, it's the biggest innovation in, in industrial controls in 40 years. 
So, you know, cloud is awesome and multi-cloud is great, but it's very ephemeral. And I like to touch and see things too, you know, so. I'm, I'm very tactile myself. Manufacturing yeah. is, is very cool. So I think there's so much edge work. I mean, VMware's already at the edge everywhere. Now yeah. it's a matter of saying, what else can we help with? How else can we add advanced, you know, cybersecurity? How else can we give you better insight with things like, you know, ARIA, network inside, and operations, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Man, that's cool. It's super cool. Um, I, I definitely, I, so they call me data center dude. I come from, um, I, I, I think people don't, for, or people forget that data centers themselves and the power and cooling systems that run them are a level of manufacturing in a way. Yeah, They're manufacturing true. power, but a lot of, it, it may not be creating something, but a lot of the PLC controls and the power switching controls and stuff like that, that's yeah. what I did in the beginning of my career. Very cool. So I've dealt with having to manually program PLC <laughs> control systems. And so you know it's painful. <laughs> uh, it's painful. So when I hear that a container can be spun up <laughs> to replace that job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. that's fantastic. On, on a gener not generic, but you know, purpose-built piece of hardware that just like a bunch of hardware vendors support vSphere, yeah. a bunch of hardware vendors can supply this distributed control node that these containers are running on, or we're running Tanzu Kubernetes Grid on these small form factor devices against the furnace. I heard the story in the keynote about Dish yeah. and uh, the 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 five G network mm -hmm. and how there was an edge vSphere device on every antenna and yeah. every tower. Yeah. Just what? Yep. Like deploying <laughs> containers through automation, CI/CD, to be able to do that that 5G and 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 all those capabilities. You know, voice calls are happening over that platform. That level of scale is borderline unfathomable to me. Yeah. I, I can't even think about what that must be like to manage. Yeah. But I bet it's pretty cool to look at in vCenter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I bet it does look pretty cool. Because <laughs> you got just millions of these containers, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Oh my God. All right, so anything else that's kind of top of mind for you aside from manufacturing? What's what what about for VMware? If you don't mind speaking for VMware, like I noticed that they're let me preface this question a little bit. There's a trend that I've noticed over the last twenty to thirty years where we it's cyclical. It's almost like a sine wave where we blow things up and then we bring them all back yeah. together. And then we yeah. blow things up and then we bring them all back together. Yeah. And we did that with VMware in a way, you can trace it back to mainframes and early right. computing as well. Like right. that was a centralization effort. But then we blew that up with client server. Then we brought it all back together with virtualization. Yeah. Kind of blew that up with the ecosystem that spun out of the VMware movement. Yeah. And brought it all back together with HCI a little bit. And now we're blowing it all up again with cloud. Right. Right. And uh, if you look at the CNCF landscape for as a beautiful example of this blowing everything up, yeah. there's over 500 different projects now, at least, uh, on the CNCF landscape. Yeah. And how does an end user keep track of all of that? What solutions they use? There's 10 different projects for to do yeah. the same thing. Yeah. I think at a certain point, customers in the industry are going to look to industry leaders like at VMware, Aneta, right. whoever, to come along and help guide them in that way. Yeah. So is that part of the process for deciding for things like Tanzu, like what you support, for things like vSphere, what you build plugins and integrations and things like for, yeah. for the framework, does that come into the conversation at all? Absolutely. Um, you know, obviously you have to keep an eye on trends, figure out where the majority of folks are trying to spend their time or what problems they're trying to solve. Yeah. And then that's you know, where we'll dedicate our development time and our product creation time and our ideation and the other side of it is, you know, we're the largest contributor to Kubernetes yeah. as a company. You know, our harbor, which is our container registry, we donated to the CNCF. And, you know, it is like the de facto container registry. It's built into some of our solutions, but people can just use it as open source. So our, you know, our contribution to open source helps build that ecosystem. And at the same time, we're able to identify those macro trends and to your point, like we blew it all out with cloud. Yep. Well, now multi-cloud services or VMware's cross-cloud services might not physically change the location, but it brings it all together in a better way. Like, yep. you know, eventually have that vCenter for different levels of services, to use that analogy. It's a great way to put it. Um, I think you had some, you had a bit of an advantage on us there. We, we've been about five or six years now, we've built this portfolio of like over 20 cloud storage, data management, backup, networking, monitoring, all of that stuff. And we, it's a wide portfolio stuff, but we didn't have vCenter in our back pocket. Yeah. So as, as partners with VMware, we're looking at, do we build our own, for lack of a better word, vCenter, or yeah. do we 
try to do more to integrate with what customers are already going to be using, whether right. that's vCenter or Kubernetes or a combination right. of the two, right? Right, right. And, and you know, the cloud consumption interface that we talked about during the show, um, that's really being able to use Kubernetes uh, commands and interface to be able to manage your underlying infrastructure. So we know that people love vCenter, it's not going anywhere, but also people are learning Kubernetes and you know, maybe they want to interact with their infrastructure in that way. So we'll build on our solid foundation to be able to meet and exceed the needs of, of our ecosystem. Uh, that sounds fantastic. That's a great way to wrap up. Yeah, Amanda, thanks so much for spending some time with me. I really appreciate it. And guys, Make sure you subscribe and follow and do all the things you guys know how to do on the social medias. And uh, thanks again for chatting with me. I appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. It's a right. pleasure. Take care, guys. Bye, everyone.